Hi, my name is Brian Bailey. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a junior majoring in Course 6-9. Today I will be telling the story of how experiments prove that the default fate for ectodermal cells is neural. First, let me set the stage. The story begins in the early 20th century. In those days, researchers were trying to fully grasp the process of gastrulation in embryos. From previous observation, they knew that ectodermal cells in the animal cap were destined to become neural tissue during gastrulation. In a rather simple experiment, it became known that the process of gastrulation decided the fate of that tissue. If you isolated part of the animal cap before gastrulation, it would only go on to become an epidermis. However, if you isolated that same part of the animal cap after gastrulation, it would develop into neural tissue. The different transformations of ectodermal tissue caused Hans Spiemann and his partner Hilda Mangold to gain a deeper interest in gastrulation. Specifically, they looked at the lip of the dorsal mesoderm, an area that would later become known as the Spiemann organizer. In a transplantation study, they removed the Spiemann organizer of an unpigmented species and placed it into the embryo of a pigmented species. Due to this, an entirely new body axis formed in the recipient embryo. The new axis contained mainly pigmented cells, implying that the Spiemann organizer of the donor was able to reorganize the cells of the recipient and induce new neural tissue. This experiment, and others alike, caused excitement within the scientific community. People wanted to find the protein capable of neural induction. Between the initial reports of neural induction in 1932 and the 1950s, hundreds of experiments were done on this subject. But it turns out that many things from adult animals sort of work as neural inducers, which made the search for the actual molecule quite difficult. Around the mid-1980s, Peter Newcomb started doing experiments involving animal and vegetal caps to see if some interaction between them was responsible for changes in the ectodermal tissue. He saw that when he isolated an animal cap, no mesoderm developed, and with no mesoderm came no neural tissue. However, if he isolated an animal cap, then recombined it with a vegetal cap, a mesoderm did develop, and the creation of neural tissue soon followed. Neural tissue only formed in the presence of both mesoderm and animal cap so the interaction between the two must be important. Newcoop also noted that future experiments must create neural tissue without the presence of any mesoderm cells. If mesoderm is present during an experiment, it could have induced the neural tissue itself, so it would be an experimental confound. From there, two groups of researchers made great progress at pretty much the same time. First, Richard Harlan and colleagues were able to find the DNA that coded for noggin a molecule that did indeed induce neural fate in ectodermal tissue. They did this by experimenting with UV irradiated embryos. As we know, a UV irradiated embryo does not develop dorsal structures, including any neural tissue that may be there. However, such an embryo can be saved in two ways. The first, a tissue transplant. The second, an mRNA injection from a normal embryo that would include the mRNA for a neural inducer somewhere in there. This particular inducer was isolated by starting from a large pool of cDNA from a healthy host, injecting it into a UV irradiated recipient, seeing if it induced any neural tissue, and repeating the experiment after removing parts of the cDNA until he could find the specific DNA that codes for noggin. At relatively the same time, Edward de Robertis and his colleagues were able to find cordon. These two molecules worked so similarly that cordon was thought to be a secondary inducer. After the success of those two groups, Melton and his colleagues were able to discover another neural inducer, folostatin. Before it was discovered to be a neural inducer, folostatin was known for being a regulatory molecule in the adult reproductive system, where it inhibits activin, a protein very similar to BMP4. In a separate experiment, Melton was able to discover that inhibiting activin in general caused neural induction by using a dominant negative approach. They were able to knock out activin receptors in ectodermal cells, which caused neural induction. This result didn't make much sense in the thinking of the time, as they had only knocked out activin receptors and didn't actually add anything known as a neural inducer. That's when it clicked that the neural state didn't need to be induced, it was actually the natural state of the ectoderm. And that state was normally inhibited by BMP4 or activin-like molecules. The experiment that sealed the deal on the issue of neural induction was done using isolated animal caps. If you isolated the animal cap and kept it intact, it would turn into epidermis. However, if you dissociated those animal cap cells, they would become neural cells because BMP4 wouldn't be able to diffuse throughout the dish. 
but if you added additional BMP4 to those separated animal cap cells, they would again turn into epidermis. This shows that anything that inhibits BMP4 can likely work as a neural inducer, even space between cells. That's all folks, thank you for listening and have a good day.